My name is Michael Dowd. I uh, am known for um, being one of the dirtiest cops in New York City Police Department history. Uh, but there's a large portion of my life that people don't know about other than that. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. And then I'll share a little bit about what happened to my, in my, me in my life and then what I do today. So I was born one of seven kids. I was born in 1961, which is at this, at this point, at 61 years ago. Uh, I was born in January. And um, I was born to a family of seven siblings. I was number three. And I, my father was a New York City firefighter. And my mother was basically a homemaker her whole life. You know, they were married very young, and they started a family very young. And we had, uh, as I said, seven siblings uh, that, we, that we grew up together with. Uh, it's funny, I oftentimes uh, think back on my childhood, and like, we were one of the larger families in the neighborhood, but not the largest. And so we didn't really like the people that had larger families than us because everybody wanted to have the biggest family. <laughs> so the people that had eight, nine, and ten kids, we weren't very nice. We, weren't, we didn't like them very much, although we all became very friends, be, friendly because back in those days, large families were a very common situation. And we grew up on Long Island. We were born in Brooklyn, most of us. My family has seven, like I said, and that was the third time. But uh, four of the seven... I believe, or well, maybe five of the seven were born in Brooklyn and the others were born on Long Island. <clears throat> so we were born in Brooklyn and raised Long Island. So if, if my accent gives it away, you'll understand why. Um, at some point in my life, uh, I had many decisions to make. I was a good student in, in school, in high school. Actually, I'm dyslexic. Uh, not egregiously dys dyslexic, but I am. And uh, I... Um, I found it very difficult to read as a young child, and it was very stressful for me, and it made me actually feel uncomfortable, and it sort of set me back amongst some of my peers when I was actually fairly intelligent, just very difficult for me to compete academically at some point, but I still got good grades, but I knew in my own heart that I felt a little inferior because of my lack of reading capability. I was very good in math, and as you know, uh, if you know anything about the documentary that was done about my life called The 7-5, I also like to count money. And, uh, and that was part of my uh, goal in life, was actually to be, to, uh, to be an accountant. So I went through high, uh, elementary school. I was always in the top athletics. I was always getting the blue ribbons uh, and at the field days, they would call them, in elementary school and in junior high school. And then I became very involved in athletics. As, as a young guy, I, was, I, was, I played high, ice hockey. I played lacrosse. And my, but my dream, I played football also, but my dream was baseball. I loved baseball. And when I got to seventh grade, uh, the guy on shortstop had a, a beard. <laughs> so, so here I was, this uh, fairly undeveloped and slow to grow Irish kid competing against guys with beards on shortstop at, in seventh and eighth and ninth grade. So as you might have known, the testosterone level was a bit higher in them at the time than myself. So they had the physiques coming in already as young young men and I was still a young I was still a boy so I realized quickly that I was not gonna be able to compete in baseball so I went on to lacrosse and other sports and uh so my dream to be a baseball player shortstop like Buddy Harrelson from the 69 Mets I um I, I was never able to, to achieve that but uh, I did excel in my grades and, and I was able to I, I learned at a young age being one of seven how to I would say, I don't want to use the word manipulate because it wasn't, it wasn't a bad thing, but people might say that today. But I learned how to, trans, to, to, to progress uh, through uh, situations where I might not have been the smartest person in the room, but I was able to take the lead in many situations because of being one of seven. I had to learn how to manage people at a young age. And uh, so, yes, so I, I got pretty good at that. Uh, and and put in any situation that I was put into the, the thereafter, as I got into my mid-teens, into my 20s, um, when I ended up in the, in the police department after leaving college, uh, I, I was two-thirds or three-quarters of my way through to getting my uh, counting degree, uh, I decided to jump into the police department. And, and I tell people the truth. The truth, the, truth is, the truth is I wanted to have a job so that I can get 
married. I wanted to be married and have uh, and start my family. So now here I am, 20, 21 years old. And for people today, that was the plan. Uh, in my, when I was in my 20s, you were supposed to be married by the time you were 24 or 25, or something was wrong. And that's just how we were raised, and that was the times. So, uh, you know, when I started to get close to 20, I had to start the plan. I got to get a family. I got to get a job. And the police department offered a job. So there was a job with security and um, benefits and medical coverage for a family. So I'm basically uh, was designing my future by taking the career in the police department. Once I got into the police department, uh, I realized that all my altruistic dreams about being a police officer and doing the right things didn't quite materialize. Um, I felt um, very early on as a police officer that the things that they trained us to do and the things that we ended up actually doing were two different things. Um, and the approach began very early on to become us against them mentality. And I, I, I learned quickly how to manipulate the freedom and the power to control situations to where I can somehow personally benefit rather than serve the public, which is why you're there, right? You become a police officer to serve the public. In my case, I became a police officer, and very early on, with a lot of the negative reinforcements, and, it, and it's, it's quite apropos at this time, because in the last week or so, NYPD finally formally announced the issuing of the Medal of Honor to uh, Serpico. Serpico is, is a long-known uh, story in the NYPD of a, a police detective who was shot in the face, allegedly by drug perpetrators on the other side, but it may have even been some cops who shot him in the face. We're not sure the actual uh, situation at that. That happened in Brooklyn in the 19, I, I don't want to say the wrong dates, but it was the late 60s to early 70s, Serpico was shot in the face, and he ended up being, the, the reason they shot him in the face is because he was testifying against cops. He was informing um, internal affairs and the, the, the federal government uh, about the corruption in, in the police department. And eventually it led to hundreds of arrests and a massive takedown of uh, one of the major units in the NYPD, which today, which at, at, at my time on the job, it was known as citywide street crime or technical narcotics division. So they were, so they sort of changed their stripes, but they, they, and, and they took back the control. These cops were freelance cops. They can do what they wanted to do and, and create the, the arrest situations that they wanted to create with very little supervision. So anybody with the ultimate power, they learned to be the ultimate corrupt. And these guys, they, they ran more drugs than the French connection themselves, these cops. Anyway, that being said, I grew up in the police department with that as the backdrop of my moving forward as a cop, that there were still cops on the job who lived and possessed that skill set. And so when I came on the job in the 82, these cops were sort of in the background because they got away with a lot of the criminal conduct that they took place, except for the hundreds that they arrested. And there was a very, a very I would say it was inner, in an inner wall of, inner, of the blue wall of silence. So that would mean they insulated themselves from the new cops. Occasionally, there'd be a crack in their wall, and they'd give you some information on how to handle something or what they might have done in this situation. And eventually, the information was passed on to me that this is what was actually going on, that there, were a lot of, there was a lot of corruption, and that these drug arrests that we were all making in the street they amounted to a grain of sand on a beach, that there was very little that we were actually doing, very little impact we were having on society in general, and uh, the flow of, of drugs into the city and out of the city, and, and, and the money that was involved was incredible. So at this point, I'm now becoming a seasoned young officer, and the crack epidemic blows up. It's 1983 or four, and I find my first crack vials in East New York, Brooklyn, and it turns out they're in some guy's mouth, and I don't know what they are, so I make them spit them down a sewer cap, uh, a sewer grating, and then later on, we get a call back to the same location that they took the sewer cap off. Now, these are 400 pound sewer caps, so some guy taking about 400 pound sewer cap off a hole, there's gotta be some real value to this thing that they just spit out of their mouth that I didn't know what it was. So it turns out that I learned the value of crack cocaine that day. 
Because not that many people for 10 vials of crack are going to open up a sewer cap, okay? And, and, and P.S., that's what happened. And so Michael Dowd was then educated that that, that stuff in, that, in those vials was worth quite a significant amount of money. In the meantime, we had been throwing it out ourselves. We didn't know what it was. And I'm talking, we were throwing out hundreds, if not thousands of vials of crack. We were just getting rid of them. And P.S., one day my, my partner takes home a bag of crack that we found, and he comes back, and I didn't even know, I didn't even know, he comes back and he hands me like $400 the next day. And I said, what's this for? He goes, that stuff I took home last night. I go, what was it? He goes, that was crack cocaine. I go, what is that? He goes, he goes I don't know, I think they smoke it. We didn't even know what they did. Long story short, it now became our mission to every day, instead of throwing this shit out, to bring it home and, and turn it into a profit. And uh, so that was like 1984, 85. The crack epidemic just was starting and the money began to fill the streets of East New York. And as a cop in East New York, you couldn't help to notice that every kid between 16 and 30 uh, dr started driving around in Mercedes Benz, Jaguars, BMWs, the boom boxes, the, the gooseneck equalizers, every car had phones. And it was, it was an explosion of cash in influx into the into the ghetto that uh, that changed history for me I became an advocate of learning how to make money out of the, uh, in, in the street and uh, it turned into quite a lucrative career at the time I went from uh, living in my parents uh, basement essentially a uh, room to uh, moving all the way up to buying three homes a condominium on the ocean in Myrtle Beach parcels of land around the country, and a couple of businesses. So I went from that poor, lower middle class white kid to a New York City police officer that now had a real estate empire beginning to bur burgeoning, and um, a couple of small businesses, actually in Florida at the time, had a bagel businesses, three of them in Melbourne, uh, by Melbourne Beach. So I was uh, starting to branch out and become quite successful. In the interim, like anything else, you know, the word starts to spread. Someone's doing too well. There's a lot of jealousy in, 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 in any profession. And when someone starts to do too well, people start to ask questions. And, uh, of course, my name popped up. Uh, and, by the way, the street was talking. The street talks, by the way, whether you know it or not. The street will talk. You know, and uh, just because I'm shaking down drug dealers in, in, in the ghetto doesn't mean that the drug dealers ain't complaining. In fact, I'll tell you an odd story. One day I, I, I robbed a drug dealer. And... Uh, I let him go, and, and, uh, and so when I let him go, I let him keep his drugs, and I took some money from him. I took four hundred and well, four hundred fifty dollars. It wasn't a lot of money, but then that, that was solid. That was a solid week's pay at least. But so I took the four hundred and put it in my pocket, and I let him go. And I thought he would just be happy with that. No, he went to the precinct and complained that I took his money. So I had to figure out a way. To, to switch the story up. So I, I went to the, the, the lieutenant on the desk, calls me to the precinct and says, Dowd, uh, pick up the phone. Like the, in, in, the, in the police job, it's called 10-1. I said, how about I 10-2? No, don't, don't. In other words, the, the lieutenant on the desk wanted to speak to me before I arrived at the precinct because he wanted me to have my story straight. So he told me on the phone that someone's making a complaint you stole money from him. I said, well, that guy's full. I listened. I don't know what you did or didn't do, but he's going to put a complaint in. We're trying to stop him. So maybe you can meet him at the front desk before he gets in. P.S. I come in the front door. I'm looking for the guy's car that I just tossed. I can't find the guy's car. Where is it? I don't know. So I walk in the precinct. I say, hey, what's going on? Uh, Hermano, what's going on? He says, oh, officer, uh, yeah, yeah, my money. You, you, you put my money back in my pocket, but there was 400 missing. I always used to peel the money off. I'd give him back the money, but I peeled a couple hundred for myself. So when I put the money back in his pocket, I put the 400 in mine and put about 800 in his. I mean, what the fuck? He should be happy, but he wasn't. And so he makes, he's trying to make the complaint. I said, did you check the back seat of your car? He goes, yeah. I go, did you look really good? So I took him back to his car, which is four blocks away from the precinct. This bastard knew that I was going to find him. He plucked, he parked his car four blocks from the precinct. I'm walking. I go, where's your car? He goes, two more blocks up. I looked at him. I, I want to fucking knock him out right there. This bastard. He, he knew he was in trouble. He knew he was a drug dealer. And he knew he was in trouble for telling on me. But he's going to do it anyway. So now I, got, now I got this guy next to me. I want to fucking rifle him because he just tried to get me arrested or fired or certainly lose a 10-day vacation. 
station. So I, I go to his car, I open up the door, I take the money out of my pocket, I throw it on the floor in his car, I go, there's your money. You didn't see it? Oh, no, I didn't see it. There's your money. Now get the fuck out of here. If I ever see you again, it's not going to be the same trip you got last time. I mean, what was I going to do? I let the guy with a bag of drugs. I mean, I'm talking he had 10 grand in drugs in his pocket. I let him go for 400. Now he's complaining. So, P.S., that story actually comes back to haunt me later on in my career because now, the, the, not only is the street talking, now the buzz is floating around the precinct that a guy came in to make a complaint that I robbed money from him. So that goes to legitimize, his complaint would have legitimized a lot of the, the silent, uh, I shouldn't say, well, the buzz. That complaint actually would have legitimized the buzz, and I would have took a big hit right there. But because I was able to stop the complaint, the buzz just continued that I was shaking people down. And I wasn't the only one. It was the 80s. The cops were shaking people down everywhere, as it turns out. I didn't know. I didn't know who was, but I knew I was. That was the beginning of the end, let's say. And at that point, I become a target of internal affairs, and they start looking at me and looking at me for the next four or five years. Eventually, along the way, I changed my procedure, but I liked money. I was, I was hooked on the money. I was hooked on the thrill of making money. I ended up getting involved with a big organization, the Diaz organization, which is a prominent part of the 7-5 documentary. If you see it, you'll see Adam Diaz in there, who we're still good friends today. I mean, many of us along the way, we remained friends. You know, he went away, I went away, we came back, they did the documentary about my life, and Adam and I became friends. In fact, we started a cigar line. Not that I'm promoting my cigars, but we started a cigar line on the way, and we still have an active cigar line. It's just, it's difficult with the uh, moving the cigars around right now. So anyway, I end up, I end up flying to the Dominican Republic. I get followed by the feds to the Dominican Republic in 1989. They, I now have an active open investigation against me by the feds. They were on the plane with me. They stayed in the same hotel as me. They followed me while I was in the DR. And of course, I really didn't know it, but I sensed something. So when I get back from the DR, they strip search me in the airport. They tried to think I was going to smuggle. I said, what do you think I'm smuggling? Fucking. And, and with PS, it was internal affairs set me up at the airport. But I had nothing on me, thank God. I was just really, I was just going to get some money. I was going to get some cash. And I didn't have and I didn't meet him because Diaz was notified by the local Dominican police not to come see me because the feds were there to watch me. So he had the inside dope on something and he wouldn't even talk to me on the phone because he had the inside dope on it, right? So I get back to New York and then uh, my career I end up uh, getting pursued heavily. I end up going to, to uh, what they call the farm, which is a rehab, while I was in the police department. And by the way, this whole time, I was a very, very well-respected police officer. My, my level of policing was always superior. Every, I handled my jobs, what they call, very well and very professionally. Now, if you were a, a drug dealer or a, a marker, I knew I could take advantage of you because of the situation. Maybe you were drunk and you were driving a car, and maybe I took a couple hundred and let you go home. You know, there was always a way to make money. If you had a, a car accident, I brought my tow truck guy to the place rather than the other tow truck guy. So my, if, 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 most, most car accidents involve two cars. Not always, but often, sometimes three cars or more. So those two cars for me were at least 500 each. So now I've learned how to make money on, on car accidents, and most police officers don't like making uh, doing paperwork. I mean, who, who likes paperwork? But the paperwork that I would do here, I knew each time I did one car, it was worth $500 to me. So I'd, I'd be the guy responding to accident scenes when most cops wouldn't. Just, oh, who wants to do the paperwork and deal with it? No, I want to do the paperwork now because I want the 500 I'm going to get from that car on the next car. She's talking $1,000 on an accident scene for a guy who's really supposed to be doing his job as a police officer, rather, I'm doing the job as a police officer for you, but I'm also benefiting myself, which is a crime. You know, and I did that a couple of dozen times. You know, I wouldn't say hundreds of times, but dozens of times. And, um, well, probably only because my career was starting to end and I didn't know it. At this point, I was, uh, I had been a daily user of cocaine and, and alcohol uh, in, the, in the late 80s into the 90s. And I had gone to rehab uh, uh, three times in one in one year I uh, kept kept failing my rehab uh, business and uh, at some point uh, they had me in a psychological program which they call the farm and while I was in the farm I was I was hoping that I would get disabled what they called job um, 
psychologically disabled from the police department so I could get a pension and walk away and, and move on with my life. The problem was, they knew this. <laughs> These people are not as stupid as we think they are. They knew that was my goal, was to, to try to get out on a disability and keep a disability pension for the rest of my life. And in the interim, my partner, Kenny Urell, who ends up putting a wire on during the 7-5 documentary, he ends up getting the three-quarters pension disability that I was hoping for. And people don't realize that if you did watch the documentary about the 7-5, they don't understand that Ken Urell was already retired with a three-quarters disability pension when he decided to uh, flip on me and, and go ahead and cooperate. Yeah, so... Um, and it was the beginning of the long uh, end of my career. At this point, it's now 89, 90. I'm, I'm starting to fail. Uh, I'm becoming the eyes of every lettered federal organization and city and state organization until one day I get a phone call from the retired police officer saying, I need, some, I need you to get me some cocaine. Of course, he didn't use that word. He used code. We got together. I didn't even know he was dealing cocaine. I ended up picking up a couple of pieces of coke, you know, half a brick, a brick, whatever I was getting for him. And then uh, eventually they had his phones. He didn't even know it. The day after Rodney King verdict comes out, uh, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, a couple of days after this, May 6th, I get arrested for being involved in a, in a drug trafficking conspiracy on Long Island, which technically I was involved, but I really wasn't hands-on in it. I just, I brought this guy a couple of pieces of, of work, uh, maybe three or four times, and uh, they had my phone right after that. And now they had a big conspiracy uh, put together, the, the Suffolk County and the state task force. I ended up getting arrested by the, by them, and then getting put out, allowed, let out on bail while I was out on bail. And remember this, ladies and gentlemen, while I was out on bail, that's when the work really began. They set me up, they put wires on, they, 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 they encouraged me through my partners and others. They brought feds in. I find out later on that there was three people actually cooperating against me while I was out on bail. My partner, the DEA agent and a narcotics, um, a narcotics convicted, not a conviction, but he was out on bail on a narcotics charge and he was a tenant in my house. So I didn't even know this in one of my houses. This guy was a tenant in my house who was cooperating. He had a relationship with this DEA agent. They brought this DEA agent, my partner Kenny, my tenant, and this DEA agent came to my house and, help, and encouraged me to get involved in a kidnapping, which eventually became a kidnapping slash murder plot, which I, I was just going along for the ride at this point, ladies and gentlemen. I was just trying to get myself out of the country to go be the captain of a shrimp boat in Nicaragua <laughs> because I didn't think they would extradite me from Nicaragua to, the, to America. Of course, they probably would have. What the hell do I know? But to so the point is, my life became, I went from being an accounting student in Suffolk County Community College to a New York City police officer. And, and you know, it's, it's the 51% it's, it's the good and 49% bad. But when you go 51% bad, 49% good, it's all bad, right? Because it, you're, you're outweighing, uh, you're, over, you're overshadowing the goodness in you. So if that 51% day was, was on that day and I, I did the wrong thing, you pay for that for the rest of your life. So I ended up uh, getting arrested by the feds. In, in, in a takedown, not even, it wasn't like the feds are here, it was a takedown. They, they stormed my house, you know, six, eight cars deep, agents, you know, this is the second arrest, by the way. I'm already been arrested while at work, a month and a half, early, three months early, I was arrested at work in uniform. Then I'm out on bail and the feds came in so they can make a federal case out of it. And so my life was quite a journey, I'd say. I uh, began as a young baseball shortstop hopeful. And I ended up uh, becoming a New York City police officer. And I guess I never let go of that accounting guy in me who wanted to handle money and, and, and learn, how to, uh, learn how to make money. My father was a fireman. He struggled all his life. I was the child that was going to bring the family to the next level. And instead of doing the right thing to take my family to the next level, I, 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 I stepped into the wrong thing. And, I, and I, I mean, not the wrong career per se, but while in that career as a police officer, I began to look for ways to capitalize rather than for ways to serve the public.
so there was a takedown by the feds, and after the takedown by the feds, I was I was I was put immediately into isolation up in Nine South in MCC New York. And if anybody knows anything about the federal system, Nine South New York is is the whole segregation. Uh, they slammed the door on me, and I was facing life in prison. And while in there, I uh, I learned a lot. There's a lot of things that happened while in that hole. That's a whole new series of things to talk about uh, between the head of cartels, the head of mobsters, all of them in the hole cooperating with the government. And I don't know that they're all they're all rats around me. And I'm talking to them about my life, and they're writing stories right back to the feds. So here I am, nine south in the hole, 1992 in. July 30th, and I'm facing life. When they closed the door behind me the first time uh, in the federal lockup, I was like, this is my life forever. In this box, that's what I thought my life was going to be. Of course, it got better, but I couldn't see the light for quite some time. I said the first 30, 40 days in there, I didn't know what was going to happen or what was going to be of, become of me. But after, you know, after the first plea offer of 30 years, can you imagine... I'm getting offered a plea offer of 30 years by the feds. And my lawyer's saying, well, that's the first offer. I looked at him, well, I didn't kill anybody. Well, that's, well, Mike, you know, you were a corrupt cop and this is what you're looking at. So I had to hold out starting at 30 until a lot of things took place. And um, well, by the way, I don't want to be remiss and not mention that I ended up testifying before the Mullen Commission, which was my beginning, I thought, uh, Return redemption. My re the beginning of my redemption was testifying before the Mullen Commission to, so I could show the police department how to correct their own procedures and how to take young officers like myself. I mean, I was still even a young guy. I was only 10 years in the police department at that point and, and teach guys how to, or superiors, how to catch me, to keep me from getting there, one, to keep me from getting to that point, and two, to catch me if I was there, really disparaging the badge. So while in the lockup, I went and I turned them down three times because they wanted me to testify against people. I told them no. Then, the, the, then the, I said, I turned it down twice. The third time I agreed because they had me in the paper for nine murders, which I didn't do. So I'm like, my lawyer said, you need a friend in the courtroom. So I agreed to testify before the Mullen Commission. I, uh, the first thing I said to them, I could teach you how to catch me if that's what you want. They said, that's what we want. That's what I gave them. And for that, for that purpose, I had worked my plea arrangement down to 11 to 17 years. And... Uh, so when I went in front of the court, I, 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 they're so slick, the feds. They moved it up to 12 and a half to 15 and a half. So they didn't want to go. So they knew where they were trying to narrow me in. And, and, so, and so when I went before the judge, I actually faced life still. Because my plea, my, my plea, my mandatory minimum was 10 with a life sentence at the end. I went in front of the judge and the judge considered my testimony before the Mullen Commission to be helpful. And she said she's going to give you a sentence. Not that, she said, I would have given you much more than the 17, by the way. She said, but because you were helpful to the Mullen Commission, I'm going to give you a, an, a, a, a sentence in the middle of your guidelines, which my actual guidelines were 12 and a half to 15 and a half. So she gave me a 14-year sentence. I left my sentencing cursing the judge out <laughs> like this bitch. But the reality is... I got what I deserved. Uh, I think I probably could have got away with seven or eight if I look at the scale of things because they enhanced my sentence for several uh, abusive position of trust and for possessing a gun. Well, of course, is, don't they come hand in hand? <laughs> the gun and the trust, they, they belong to the same They belong to the same product, the cop. But anyway, so that cost me three more years right there. So anyway, the, the point I'm making is I, I, sentenced, I got a 14-year sentence, which I guess in the scale of things is somewhat reasonable. But if you tell somebody they're going to spend a decade plus from 31 to 43 in prison, you might want to change your life before facing that in the future. So my message to the people that are listening to me here today, recant my, my life of uh, experience is, you know, we have to try to remember why we're there. You know, uh, in my case, I took the police job because I wanted to be married and have kids. Turned out that I forgot that along the way, and I wanted to become a, a mogul, a real estate mogul, and I wanted to become, I wanted to become uh, Don Johnson. I, I wanted to become Don Johnson, uh, you know. So uh, 
I took the wrong steps. It's been a life of uh, reparation since then. I do what I can today. I speak to kids. I go to colleges. Um, I get involved wherever I'm allowed to be involved. It's quite a humbling position to be in when you when you were part of a, when you when you're in the police, law enforcement family, even civil service family. You're part of a big family, and then when you when you do what I did and you disparage your own profession and your badge and your, your shield and the NYPD, we call it a shield. When you disparage, disparage your shield, you lose, you immediately lose a huge family of, uh, that you belong to. And now you're an outsider. And that was probably one of the worst feelings I had besides facing my family and my mother with my, with my conduct, who she knew all along something was wrong. She was the one who knew the whole time. My mother knew the whole time I was doing something wrong. Everybody else thought I was just managing and manipulating things well, owning homes, owning real estate. Great. I did great in Atlantic City, like every time, you know, because when you come back with extra money, you know, where'd you get it from? So, yeah. So, uh, but my mom knew something was wrong because she said, why are your brothers always just before payday struggling and you never had a struggle? And you had the same jobs because they were all firemen and cops, my brothers, as, my, as was my father. So I, I, I grew up in a civil service family, and most of, the, most of my family was, took their jobs very seriously and served the public to the best of their ability. And I, uh, I just was the one that had that little bit of extra in him who wanted more and, and never settled for less. And, you know, part of that's still my character and my nature. So I still try to strive for more. But today I take the proper approach. I... I, I, I I slow down. Uh, I, I have the demons. I make them stop talking to me. Or, or if they are talking to me, I say, well, listen, what's the end result of this? Where's it going to take me? And I know where it's taken me in the past. So today, I try to do the right thing 51% of the time and let that 49% bad guy stay asleep. So remember that, that there's consequences to all our actions. I think I paid significant amount. Others say that I didn't pay enough. Well, let that person spend 10 days in prison and then come back to me and tell me that I didn't pay enough. So thank you very much. I appreciate you, Matt Cox for having me on his show. Thank you, Matt.